Hello and welcome to Super Great Kids Stories. Wise tales from storytellers around the world which will make you laugh and sometimes cry. Recommended for ages 5 to 105. I'm Kim and I love stories. Hello Super Great Kids and how are you? I'm very pleased because the sun is shining the birds are singing and we've been recording some new storytellers. And you're going to hear from one of them today. His name is Seth Townsend. Seth loves travelling and collecting stories. He's travelled from Beijing in China to Belfast in Northern Ireland to Buenos Aires in Argentina. And next week... He's going to a storytelling festival in Marrakesh in North Africa. But today, he's come into the Super Great Kids studio to tell us a fairy tale from Iran. Before we meet Seth, can you have a think about how many countries you can name while we have a quick word with the grown-ups? I'll name a couple of countries to get you started. There's Italy... And there's Australia. So off you go. Well, hello there, grown-ups and Super Great Kids Stories fans. As you probably know, we depend on your generosity and support to keep making this podcast. If you subscribe and join the Owlets Club, you'll get access to all sorts of lovely extras like subscriber-only episodes, early and ad-free episodes, as well as a newsletter from Story Owl, word puzzles, book recommendations, ooh, and film footage of our live shows. To support Super Great Kids Stories and join the Owlets Club, just click subscribe in Apple Podcasts or visit patreon.com forward slash supergreatkidsstories. Hello, super great kids. I'm back. How many countries did you think of? I bet you thought of quite a few. Did you know there are about 200 countries in the world? Wow. I bet your grown-ups can name quite a few of them. You might want to test them. The story today is from Iran, a country I'm lucky enough to have visited. The story today is from Iran, a country I'm lucky enough to have visited. Here are a few facts. Iran has mountains on one side and a salty desert on the other side. And at the top and the bottom of Iran, there are seas. Iran used to be called Persia. People there are known to be very friendly and welcoming. The food is delicious. Fragrant rice and kebabs and flatbread. Most Iranians are Muslim or followers of Islam. So their weekend is on a Thursday and Friday. And you know those beautiful, great, big, fat, fluffy cats called Persian cats? They come from the Shiraz region of Iran. And there are also leopards and big brown bears in Iran. But you certainly wouldn't want to keep them as pets. Right, are you ready? Let's give a warm welcome to storyteller Seth Townsend. Hooray! Hello, my name is Seth and I'm a storyteller who works all over the world. And the story I'm going to tell today is from Iran. And many of my friends come from Iran, so I'd like to share with you this little tale. And in Iran, to say, once upon a time, you say, Ruzi Ruzigari. Ruzi Ruzigari. There was a poor woman, and her name was Mara. And Mara 
She had a husband, and she had a little daughter, a little baby daughter. But she was very poor, and she used to go out every day to collect herbs that she could find around the village that would make the rice that her family ate a little more tasty. And one day she found herself in a ruined old palace garden. The walls had broken down. It seemed that nobody lived there. But she saw that there were fig trees, and all over the ground there were figs that were rotting, and the bees and the flies were coming and eating all of the rotten fruit. But quite a few of the fruit were still good, and so I think I'll take some of these figs home with me. Oh, my family will be so happy. And she leant down, and as soon as she touched one of the figs, <laughs> What are you doing? Out of a puff of smoke came a horrible-looking witch. But this witch had one, two, three warts on her nose. And on her chin, she had one, two, three, four, five scars. And she was very frightening. You are stealing my figs, and so you will have to pay for them. I want a hundred golden coins for you to pay for that fig. But I haven't got a hundred golden coins. All I've got is a cooking pot and a husband and a little baby. Well, I don't need a cooking pot and I don't need a husband, so I'll have the baby. <laughs> no, no, no! And in that moment there was a flash and the witch she disappeared. <gasps> and the next thing that Mara knew was when she woke up she had been so frightened at the idea that the witch would take her baby in payment for the fig that she fainted, and she walked home. And when she got home, she sat down, and that night her husband and her little baby, all they had to eat was rice, no figs, no herbs, no mint. But time passed, and she soon forgot about this horrible little thing that had happened to her. And as time passed, her husband, he made more money. He started selling things, and they moved to the next village in a nice house, and life was good. And by now, Mara's little girl, who was called Gulbahar, she was growing up. Was she fourteen? Was she fifteen? Was she sixteen? The story doesn't tell us, but what we do know is that her name, Gul Bahar, means flower, Gul, of springtime, Bahar. And she was so beautiful, she was like a flower from the springtime. And one day, she was playing hide-and-seek with her friends in a lovely green grassy place with lovely spring flowers. And her friends were behind her, but she was chasing a lovely butterfly. And she saw that this butterfly, on one of its wings, it had one, two, three little round marks. And on the other wing, it had one, two, three, four five stripes. Unusual, but she reached out to this lovely butterfly, and as soon as her fingers touched the butterfly, there was a puff of smoke. <laughs> now I have finally found you, Gulbaha. How do you know my name? I know your name. Of course I know your name. I've been looking for you for a long time. Because I'm going to take you away with me. I don't want to go away. Oh, you have to come away with me because 
A long time ago, your mother said that you would be payment for the fig that she stole from my garden. Now, I'm not kidnapping you. You are coming as payment for the fig that your mother bought from me. And the witch put her into a black carriage, and she got in with her, and off they rode until they came to that very same broken-down palace where our story started. And she took Gulmaha, she put her onto her stick behind her and flew through the window. Because there were no doors in this palace, just windows. And there they went into the palace, the broken-down old palace. And the witch said, right. You can work for me. You can sit in the corner there and you can knit and I will bring you food every day and you can stay there and I want you to knit and knit and knit. And at that point, the witch flew out of the window and Kulbaha was in this little room with nothing but a pair of knitting needles and balls and balls of wool. And she was so unhappy. But there was nothing else to do but to start knitting. And she was knitting. She was knitting. She was knitting all day long. And at night time, in through the window came the witch. And she said, Now, Gulbaha, here is some food for you. And all that she had was some rice and some figs, and off went the witch. So the next day she heard from below the old witch singing, Gulbaha, Gulbaha, sweet and fair, here comes Granny, let down your hair. Now, what I didn't tell you before is that Gulbaha had beautiful long hair, and the witch wanted her to use her hair as a ladder. And so Gulbaha let down her long hair, and the witch climbed up the long hair and came in. She said, this is the way we will do it every day. And she brought her some rice, and she brought her a fig, and she said, now, Gulbaha, I want you to make sure that you knit plenty for me. But there are three things you should not do. And the first is, don't look into the chest under the stairs. And the second thing is, do not look into the mirror. And the third thing is, do not look out of the window onto the street below. Understand? Yes. Granny. Now she called her Granny, although it wasn't her Granny. That's just a way in Iran where you supposed to be nice to old people. You call them Granny. And the witch once more flew out of the window. So what was the first thing that Kulbaha did that she wasn't supposed to do? Yes. Have you got it? She went under the stairs, she opened the chest, and all she saw were three balls of wool. A green ball of wool, a blue ball of wool, and a red ball of wool. Is that all? And she closed the lid of the chest and went back to her knitting. Well, once more... Gulbaha, Gulbaha, sweet and fair, Granny's coming, let down your hair. And that old witch climbed up her hair and said, Have you been doing something you shouldn't do? Oh, no, Granny, no. Well, here's your food. And off she flew again. Now the next day, Gulbaha was knitting and knitting and knitting, and she thought, Maybe I'll do the next thing I'm not supposed to do. So what was the next thing that Gulbaha did that she wasn't supposed to do? Yes, have you got it?
she looked into the mirror. And in the mirror, there was a face. And the face said, It's okay, Gulbaha, don't be frightened. What I want to tell you is the three balls of wool are where the witch gets her power from, and they might help you if you are in danger. <gasps> Gulbaha thought, Well, this is getting interesting. But many years passed, and Gulba had been there for seven long years. And in this time, apart from knitting, she thought that she could do some of the magic spells that she saw the witch doing. And to cheer herself up, she would make a little magic spell and there would be flowers dancing all about the room, and that was very nice for her. And another little magic spell she could do was to make her knitting needles play a tune. But all she wanted was to be at home with her family. But she had to knit, she had to knit, she had to knit. And the three things that she wasn't supposed to do, she'd already done two of them. And so the last thing, can you remember what it was? <sighs> yes, one day. She stood up from her seat where she was knitting, and she looked out of the window, and she saw the people below her, the people coming, the people going. Oh, this reminded her of her life that she had before. But then on the other side of the road, there was a young man, and he waved to her. He was a handsome young man, and he walked to the bottom of the palace wall, and he sang. Kulbaha, Kulbaha, sweet and fair, someone's coming, let down your hair. And she did. She let down her hair from that upstairs window right down to the bottom, and he climbed up, and he came through the window, and he was a lovely young man. And he said, What are you doing here? I've heard the witch singing all the time, every day, and I thought I wanted to meet you, and now I am meeting you. And she told him the whole sad story, and he said, Well, I am a prince from the neighbouring country, and I'll bring my father here to tear down this palace and to set you free. And just at that moment they heard... Kulbaha, Kulbaha, sweet and fair, Granny's coming, let down your hair. Quick, quick, what, what could she do? What could she do? <gasps> yes, one of my spells, maybe it will work. And she turned the young prince into a shawl, and she hung him on a nail on the wall. Kulbaha, Kulbaha, sweet and fair, Granny's coming, let down your hair. And she climbed up and she said, Kulbaha, I had to sing to you twice. What was going on? Can I smell? Can I smell? Can I smell humans? Oh, the window was open. It must be the smelly people down below. Look, I made you a scarf. I made you a shawl. And she handed it to the witch and she said, I don't need a shawl. And she hung it back on the nail on the wall. Here, have your food. And off she flew again through the window. <gasps> the witch was gone. What could they do? Quick, quick, I must turn him back into the prince. Can I make the spell work? Ah, oh, yes, he was back into the prince. The prince said, we've got to escape. What can we do? Have you got any, any bedding, any sheets, any? Yes, there are sheets, there are sheets. Tie the sheets together. And so they tied the sheets together, one after the other, after the other, until there was a long, long rope made of sheets. But wait, wait, I've forgotten something. I was told that when I'm in danger, I needed these things. And she went to the chest, and what did she get? those three balls of wool. And she put the balls of wool into her pockets and off they went down that rope 
of sheets onto his horse and they charged away. Clippity cloppity clippity clop, ba dum ba dum ba dum. Clippity cloppity clippity cloppity ba dum ba dum ba dum. And now it was almost midnight. But they were still running, still running, still running. At that point, for some reason, the witch came back. Gulbaha, Gulbaha, sweet and fair, Granny's coming, I think something's happening, let down your hair. But there was no hair, there was no hair let down, and so the witch had to fly in through the window, and she saw that the chest was open, the balls of wool had gone, and Gulbaha was nowhere to be found. So she took off her shoe from her foot, and she filled it with water. And when she looked into the shoe, full of water, she could see Gulbaha and a young man. He looked like a prince. They were on a horse, and they were galloping, 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 galloping away. And so she set off behind them, and she flew, and she flew, and she flew. And Gulbaha looked behind, and she said, The witch is behind us. And the prince said, Quick, take that green ball of wool and throw it behind you. She threw it over her shoulders, and immediately a whole forest of spiky, thorny, green brambles grew. And the witch was being scratched as she pushed her way through those brambles. Uh, uh, uh. By now, it was first thing in the morning. The sun was coming up over the horizon, and they were still clippity cloppity clippity clop, ba dum ba dum ba dum, clippity cloppity clippity cloppity ba dum ba dum ba dum. But there, she looked behind, and the witch was catching up with them. And the prince said, "Quick, throw behind the blue ball of wool," and she threw it over her shoulder, and the blue ball of wool turned into a huge. Lake, and the witch was in the water. <coughs> was she drowning? No, she wasn't. What did the witch do? She <coughs> started drinking, drinking, drinking that water. <coughs> but Gulbaha and her prince were galloping, 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 galloping away. And now it was midday, and she looked behind her, and there was the witch again. How could she do it? because the witch had drunk that whole lake of water and she was almost behind them, almost catching up. And the prince said, Quick, throw the red ball of wool behind you. And she did it and immediately a huge fire burnt the witch to ashes. <sighs> That's the end of the witch. Yes. And they went to the prince's kingdom. And the prince said, Do you know, Gulbaha, I would like you to come and live here with me. Maybe you'd like to marry me. Ah, oh, yes, I would love to marry you. But I can't stay here without my parents. And the prince sent for Gulbaha's parents. And they came to live in the palace of the prince and his father. And they all lived happily ever after. Thank you very much to Seth Townsend for sharing that magical story. Did it remind you of a fairy tale which you know? <laughs> yes. It was a bit like Rapunzel, which is the German version collected by the Brothers Grimm. Maybe you can talk to your grown-ups about how that story was similar and how it's different to the version that you know. Part of the story Seth told us reminds me a little bit of one of the Baba Yaga stories. Can you think which part it's like? Well, I'll tell you. Cover your ears if you want to work it out for yourself. It's where Gulbaha throws down the balls of wool and they turn into a lake and into a forest of brambles. Did you guess it correctly? Now, to dig deep into my bag of happies and say hello and thank you to some super great kids fans and to some new owlets who've subscribed to our podcast and swooped into our nest. 
Hello to Isaac from London, who is just turning four, and to his older brother Elias. I hope you enjoy your celebration day, Isaac. And hello to Jasmine, who is five, from Canberra in Australia. Jasmine has been listening to Super Great Kids since she was three. And she loves retelling the stories, especially the scary ones. Jasmine is about to start school, or kindy as Australians call it. Welcome Jasmine to the Owlets Club. Hope your new friends at school enjoy listening to your storytelling. And hello to Bertie, who is six, and Trixie, who is three, from London. Bertie and Trixie sat on the front row of our show last October and we had a little chat afterwards. Hurrah! And hello to Ava, who is seven, and to Gray, who is four, from West Virginia in the US. Thanks for your Baba Yaga picture, Ava. Your witch has got lots of character sitting in her mortar and grimacing. Super scary. And thanks to Etty from Preston in England, who is very excited to become an owlet. How Raven brought light to the world is one of her favourites. She was very brave listening to the ghost of the bloody finger with her mum. Well done, Etty. And a big hello to new owlets and super fans, Florence, who is six, and Harry, who is four, who are living in Adelaide in Australia. Thanks also very much to all our Kofi donors this week. Thank you to Nora, who is six, for helping us to keep telling these stories. It's very kind of you. Baba Yaga and Baby Crocodile are some of my favourite stories too. And thank you to Joshua. Very kind of you to help us. Glad you're enjoying the stories. And thanks to twins Ottilie and Max. I agree, The Golden Bolt is a very thought-provoking story. Nick Hennessy, the storyteller who told it, is a very thoughtful person. I'll tell him you enjoyed it. He'll be really chuffed. Ah, oh, and thank you to Victor and your mum for helping us to keep telling our stories. I'm glad it helps you to relax after school, Victor. Great that you like football. Wasn't the World Cup exciting? Now, there are lots of you swooping into our nest at the moment, so if your name wasn't there, do let us know and we'll do our best to say hoo, 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 and thanks to you. And lots of you, including some owlets, have been sending in such inspiring pictures of our stories. We just love seeing them. I'd like to say thanks to some of you. Thanks to five-year-old Lillian from Ontario in Canada, who enjoys listening to Super Great Kids stories as part of her homeschooling with her mum. Lillian has drawn two lovely pictures, one of Stick Woman and one of Anansi and the Magic Pot. Thank you, Lillian. And thanks to Owlet Romy, who is five, from Powys in Wales. Thanks so much, Romy, for your lovely picture of Why the Whale Has a Sad Song. I really like your huge whale with an open mouth and the crow flying with outstretched wings and the little tortoise who's watching, pleased that the problem has been solved. Pleased that the problem has been solved. A very imaginative picture of a great story. Thank you. And thanks to Evan, who is six, from Perth in Australia, who's drawn a very imaginative picture of the griffin flying through the air and carrying an ox. And you've somehow made him look very determined, which is very clever of you, Evan. I think it's in the eye. It's an interesting story, isn't it? And thanks to Evelyn for sharing your lovely picture of the gardener telling the king a story by the fire from the king's storyteller. Your picture has a very happy feel. It's lovely. Thank you, Evelyn. And thanks to Ethan, who is eight, from Lewisburg in West Virginia. Ethan loved the ghost of the bloody finger so much that he rushed down from his bed after hearing it and drew a picture straight away, which he then shared with us. I love the shape of your ghost, Ethan, with his furrowed brows and jaggedy teeth. Just super scary. Well done for listening to it at night as well. 
And finally, thanks to six-year-old Fatima from Chicago in the US for your lovely picture of the scarecrow and the hare. Lots of very creative details in your picture, Fatima. I love the way you've drawn the scarecrow wearing raggedy clothes tied up with string with all the straw stuffing poking out. And the background is so effective with all the snowflakes falling down. Thank you. And thank you all. If you'd like to see those great pictures, go to facebook.com forward slash super great kids stories. That's all for now. Keep on telling your stories and singing your songs. And if you're a subscriber, there's a Chinese version of Little Red Riding Hood coming soon as your February bonus story. And also, there's a super great scary story from Kate Corkery. See you soon. This story was recorded at Wardour Studios in London.